Thank you for joining the CMBB seminar. And um, my name is Shaila Jalani. I am associated with the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry and the Center for Molecular Biology and Biotechnology. So today our guest speaker is uh, Dana Voglitis. And uh, Dana, she's the Assistant Director of the Office of Technology Development, which is part of the Division of Research at FAU. She has served the university in this role for over four years. Prior to FAU, Dana worked as an in-house attorney advising on intellectual property matters at the Florida Institute for Commercialization of Public Research in Boca Raton and at Lincoln Center for the Performing Arts in New York City. She is licensed to practice law in Florida, New York, and New Jersey, and is a certified licensing professional. So um, the information that Dana is going to give today is very relevant to all of you and all of us uh, because we had a wonderful talk uh, by Dana last semester in one of my courses. And so it is, it's fun and very interesting. Now, uh, before I give it off to Dana, a couple uh, reminders. If you have any questions, please um, type them in the Q&A box. Do not use the chat option because that feature is disabled. And you can type in questions as uh, you go through the seminar, but we will um, have the question and answer session at the end of the seminar. Okay, with that, uh, Dana, thank you so much for taking time. It's all yours. Yeah, they are moving. All good. right, great. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for logging on to this webinar today. I'm excited to speak with all of you. Um, so like, uh, Shailaja mentioned, my name is Dana Voglitis, and I'm the Assistant Director for the Office of Technology Development here at Florida Atlantic University. And today I want to talk to you about intellectual property and technology transfer, which are two subjects that will impact your research at some point, whether you remain in academia or pursue a career in industry or anything in between. So I hope our talk today is helpful for you. Uh, so the topics I'd like to discuss, I'll introduce my office, explain a little bit about the different types of intellectual property, and explain how the technology transfer process works, uh, specifically here at FAU, um, but also applicable to other universities and companies as well. So first we'll start with my office. So. We're in office of two right now at FAU. Uh, myself, I'm the assistant director, um, and I also work with Regina Thompson, um, who if you don't know, is the strategic and economic initiatives manager here at FAU. Uh, so while she doesn't work directly for me, uh, she does assist my office um, with interfacing with faculty and students and finding out what type of research they're working on and whether anything uh, should be protected or commercialized. So you may speak with either one of us if you have any questions. And our office has two primary goals. The first is legal protection for intellectual property that's developed through research here at FAU. And I'll talk about the different types of protection you can get in just a minute. Uh, our office also works to commercialize this intellectual property, typically through license agreements or sponsored research with either large established companies or startup companies. So let's go through the different types of intellectual property that you may encounter in your research. There's four main types, patents, copyrights, trademarks, and trade secrets. Um, in the university context, you'll likely encounter the first three, uh, probably not trade secrets, but if you have any aspirations to work in industry or start your own company, you may encounter that. So I like to give a good overview of all four. So we'll start with patents. So a patent is something that protects processes, machines, articles of manufacture or compositions of matter. And I think all of these categories are applicable to your research in molecular biology or biotechnology. So an invention you create could fall into any one of those categories. You should know that a patent doesn't protect laws of nature, physical phenomena, abstract ideas, or any information that's already in the public domain. 
And a patent is really an exclusionary right. It gives the owner the ability to prevent others from doing things. They cannot make your invention. They can't use it. They can't sell it. They can't market it uh, within the United States or uh, whatever country you've obtained protection in. So what are some of the requirements to obtain a patent? First, it has to be new, it has to be different from what already exists out there. Second, it has to be useful. It has to have some real world utility. It has to serve a purpose. Third, it has to be non-obvious, meaning uh, the invention isn't obvious to someone who works in the field of the invention. So one of your colleagues in molecular biology or biotechnology wouldn't think that it's obvious to do whatever you have created. Um, and fourth, and maybe most importantly in the university context is that the invention can't be publicly disclosed. You cannot have used it, published it, sold it um, more than one year before you filed for a patent application. And just to go into a little bit more detail on public disclosures and, and what type of form that could take. Um, it could be a research paper you submit. It could be a grant abstract, a speech at a conference, poster presentations, or peer discussions. And when I mention all of these things, um, say you're an FAU student and you create something at FAU. If you're speaking with your professor at FAU or you give an internal presentation at FAU, that's not considered a public disclosure. What makes it a public disclosure is when you go outside the FAU community and tell others about what you've created. So here's a look at the patent application process. Uh, first, obviously, you have to invent something. So the invention is conceived by the researcher. Uh, and then the next step would be to draft the patent application. Uh, so you would work with a patent attorney or patent agent to draft the claims of the application. Um, and the application has a lot of different parts. There's a written description, uh, but the claims are really the uh, legal description of what your invention is and really what's the protectable aspects of your invention. Um, so drafting a patent application uh, can take anywhere from a couple weeks to a couple months, uh, really depends on the nature of the application and the complexity of the invention. Uh, but then you would file that application with the relevant patent office. Uh, typically at FAU, we'll file in the United States, but if there are circumstances that warrant international protection, we can do that as well, and there's a whole separate process for that. Um, and once you filed, uh, that's when the waiting period starts. It typically takes, I believe, a year and a half right now to hear back from the patent office once you filed a patent application. Um, and that's just because of the uh, caseload that all the patent examiners at the patent office have before them right now. It's just a, a longer waiting period. Um, but once the examiner gets to your application and reviews it, typically what happens next is they will either send you a notice of allowance, meaning that your patent application has been approved for issuance into a patent. That's a pretty rare scenario. What's more likely to happen is that you will be uh, the recipient of what's called an office action, which is essentially the patent examiner's uh, description of their objections to your application, um, what they think needs to be improved upon or changed, um, if they think something isn't particularly novel or they think something's obvious or there's prior art that stands in the way of you getting a patent, they'll put all of those uh, objections in an office action. Um, and then from there on, you're in the part of the process called patent prosecution, and that's just the back and forth communication between you and the patent office. Um, it could last months, it could potentially last a year or more, it really just depends on the application. But hopefully at the end of that process, what happens is the patent office will issue you a patent. And typically patent protection is good uh, from the date of filing uh, plus 20 years. So for this group especially, I just wanted to spend a couple of moments talking about biological patents in particular, because I know that's of interest to you. 
So biological patents protect inventions in the field of biology and can include things such as biotechnology products, genetically modified organisms, and genetic material. And up until about 2013, natural biological substances could be patented in the United States if they were what the courts call sufficiently isolated from their naturally occurring states. So some examples of isolated materials that received patents prior to 2013 include things like adrenaline, insulin, vitamin B12, and, and various other genes. Um, but then there was a Supreme Court case um, in 2013 uh, called Myriad Genetics. Uh, and in that case, the court declared that naturally occurring DNA sequences uh, were ineligible for patents. And specifically in this case, they were talking about the BRCA genes associated with breast cancer. Uh, the court held that just isolating the genes found in nature doesn't make them patentable. There has to be some sort of man-made manipulation that goes above and beyond how these things occur in nature in order for it to be eligible for a patent. So some prominent biological patents, uh, things that have received patents in the past, I mentioned adrenaline, something that was patentable prior to 2013, but if you tried to get a patent on that now, you probably wouldn't be able to. Um, genetically modified bacteria strains that are used for clearing up oil spills have been patented. Um, genetically modified stem cells have been patented. Uh, mouse models, uh, this is the Onco mouse that Harvard University patented to study cancer. Uh, entire genomes have been patented. There was one patented recently by the University of California. Um, and even food can sometimes be patented. Uh, picture below represents uh, basmati rice, which was uh, genetically modified uh, by a company called Rice Tech in the 90s. So biological patents can really uh, cover a diverse array of inventions. So let's move on to the next type of intellectual property, copyrights. So a copyright is different from a patent in that it protects creative works mostly instead of scientific and technical works. Um, it can protect things such as book, music, plays, choreography, photographs, paintings, sculptures, movies, and even architecture. And copyright doesn't protect the idea itself. It protects the creative expression of that idea. Um, and another difference from patents is that um, unlike patents where you have an exclusionary right, you have a right to prevent people from doing something, with a copyright, you're given a bundle of affirmative rights. Uh, so you as the copyright owner have the right to reproduce your work, distribute it, publicly display it, and publicly perform it. Requirements to obtain a copyright are much less uh, intense than patents. Really, it just has to be an original work of authorship, something that originally came from you, you didn't copy from anyone else. And it has to be fixed in a tangible medium of expression, which essentially just means it's written down, whether that's hard copy or electronically somehow. And to register a copyright, um, it's a fairly straightforward process. Uh, registration is actually optional. You already have copyright protection as soon as you create the work and fix it. Um, but registration enhances your legal rights. It uh, provides a presumption that the copyright is valid. It puts the public on notice that you are enforcing your copyright ownership um, and it allows you to, to sue in federal court. Um, so if you decide to register, uh, you would file a short form. A copyright attorney could assist you with that in the relevant copyright office, whether that's the United States or elsewhere. Um, and several months after you file for registration, the Copyright Office publishes a circular, um, putting the public on notice that you are applying for copyright registration. Um, and then another few months after that, uh, the registration should issue and a copyright is typically valid uh, for the life of the author plus 70 years. And that can vary slightly depending on the circumstances under which the work was created. So one recent case uh, in pop culture that some of you may have heard of um, has to do with recording artist Taylor Swift and the musical group 3LW. 
So in 2014, Taylor Swift wrote a song called Shake It Off, uh, which included the lyrics, player's gonna play and hater's gonna hate. Uh, was a big chart topper for Swift, uh, spent 50 weeks atop the Billboard Hot 100 and presumably made her a lot of money. However, two songwriters accused her of copyright infringement in 2017 based on a song that they had written for a musical group called 3 Hell W in 2001 that had the lyrics, play as they gonna play and haters they gonna hate. And they sued Taylor Swift for $42 million in damages. Uh, it was interesting when this case got to court because initially the trial judge dismissed the case because he didn't feel that the 3LW lyrics uh, had sufficient originality to merit copyright protection. Uh, but that case was appealed and the appeals court overturned that decision and sent it back to the lower court where it is right now. So you can take a look at the lyrics side by side and decide for yourself whether you think the lyrics on the right are sufficiently original to merit copyright protection and whether the lyrics on the left are sufficiently similar to those on the right that uh, would cause them to be infringing on their copyright. So just an interesting case that's going on right now in the world of copyrights. Now we'll move on to the third type of IP protection known as trademarks. So what is a trademark? A trademark is, is different from patents and copyrights in that it's primarily used by businesses. It designates a source of goods or services, and it can protect things like words, designs, sounds, or colors. So some examples I typically give are the NBC News chimes that you hear when there's an NBC News newscast, uh, or the color Tiffany blue, the jewelry company Tiffany has a specific blue color that they have trademarked. Uh, and the purpose behind obtaining trademark protection is that it denotes a standard of quality. Um, it's a way for consumers to distinguish your product or service from that of one of your competitors. And it's really designed to protect the computer, the consumers and avoid any kind of confusion amongst brands. So the requirements to obtain a trademark are pretty straightforward. Um, it has to be what the Patent and Trademark Office deems to be a strong mark. And there's a, a spectrum uh, of categories that they use to determine if the mark is strong or not. So an example of a weak mark would be something like the term escalator. Originally, there was a company, um, presumably called Escalator or something similar, and they were the only ones that could use that term to refer to a moving staircase. But now, as you know, that term has become what we call genericized, meaning that whenever you see a moving staircase, everybody refers to it as an escalator. You don't know what company made it. It's just what everybody calls it. So that's an example of a weak mark. Um, an example of a strong mark would be Nike, the Nike swoosh that you see on all their products. Um, so that's a combination of a word and a symbol. And that's considered to be a strong mark because you wouldn't automatically associate the word Nike, which I believe is originally a Greek or Roman god, uh, with athletic apparel or shoes. Um, so Nike was pretty creative in, in naming itself and the trademark office rewarded them for that. Uh, the second requirement is that there can cannot be any likelihood of confusion um, amongst consumers between your trademark and trademarks that have already been registered by your competitors and other companies. Um, and the final requirement is that you have to use the mark in commerce. You have to be consistently selling products or services. So the trademark registration process is somewhat similar to copyrights. Uh, you have the option to register your trademark um, I always recommend it because again, it enhances your legal rights. It allows you to sue in federal court. It gives you a presumption that your trademark is valid um, and it puts the public on notice that you're enforcing your trademark rights. Uh, so if you're interested in that, you would file the registration with a trademark attorney in the relevant trademark office, whether in the US or abroad. Uh, several months after that, it would be examined by the US Patent and Trademark Office. Um, and this is where it gets more similar to patents. There actually is a trademark prosecution process where the trademark examiner could issue an office action stating their objections to your application 
and you would have to communicate with them back and forth to resolve those objections. Uh, but hopefully at the end of that, you would be issued a trademark and trademark protection is valid theoretically forever, as long as you're continuing to use the mark in commerce. So here's just a quick look at some of the 10 most valuable trademarks. Uh, so these are all names you should all be familiar with. Google, IBM, GE, Walmart, Vodafone, Apple, Wells Fargo, Microsoft, Bank of America, and AT&T. And these dollar figures are a couple years old. So probably their trademarks are worth even more than that now. So it just gives you an idea of what a well thought out trademark can be worth. All right, and we'll move on to the last type of intellectual property protection, which is trade secrets. So a trade secret protects a formula, practice, process, a design, instrument, pattern, method, any information that is not known to the public. Uh, and the only requirement for a trade secret is, you guessed it, to keep it secret. Um, and basically the reason uh, companies use trade secrets is it gives them a economic advantage over their competitors. So here's just a look at some famous trade secrets. Uh, formula for Google is considered to be a trade secret. The recipe for Big Mac sauce is a trade secret. Uh, the formula for the New York Times bestseller list is a trade secret. Formula for Listerine. Uh, the recipe for Kentucky Fried Chicken. Uh, the recipe for Twinkies. Uh, formula for Coca-Cola the recipe for the glaze on Krispy Kreme donuts, uh, some kind of baseball rubbing mud that I hadn't heard of until I researched it for this presentation, and WD-40. So these are all things where the company has decided to keep that information secret and use that to their advantage over their competitors. All right, now I just wanna wrap up by going over the technology transfer process, which uh, is essentially the movement of research and intellectual property from university or possibly a company uh, to industry to benefit the general public. And depending on where your research career leads you, um, you will probably encounter the technology transfer process. So why is technology transfer important? Uh, it helps to facilitate commercialization of research results for the public good. It moves your ideas out of the lab and into the real world. Um, in the university setting, it can help to reward, retain, and recruit faculty. Uh, it helps induce closer ties to industry by working with them to commercialize these ideas. Uh, generates income for everyone involved, promotes economic growth. Maybe you start a company around your idea. Um, and it's also necessary in some cases for compliance with federal law. So the technology transfer process, um, this is at FAU, but you'll find the process is similar at other universities and companies as well, um, is that you submit what's called an invention disclosure. So you submit the invention or the work um, to my office. We review it and determine the best way to proceed with protecting it and commercializing it. Uh, so we'll do two types of assessments, uh, a market assessment for commercial potential and a legal assessment to determine the best method of protection for it. Uh, then once we decide to move forward and we've protected the IP, uh, we'll start promoting it to companies, we'll start marketing it and try to find uh, someone that's interested in licensing it to us. Uh, and then once we identify a suitable licensee, uh, we'll negotiate an agreement with them and that's that. So at FAU specifically, um, and again, you'll find this similar at other places you may go, uh, you're required to file an invention disclosure if you're FAU faculty, staff, or student, and the invention or work is made in the field or discipline in which you're engaged by the university, or if it's made with the use of university support. And university support can be things like you're using FAU space, uh, facilities, equipment, other personnel, things of that nature, things that um, have value. 
Uh, so then when we move on to the assessment process, like I mentioned, we conduct a market assessment. We look at your idea um, and determine if there's a need for it in the marketplace, what's the potential competition, what would be the costs uh, to commercialize it, what would be the potential revenues to a commercializing entity. Uh, we look at it from that perspective. And then we also look at it from a legal perspective and determine, you know, is this something that can be patented or would it be best protected by copyright or trade secret? Uh, and we'll evaluate the best method of protection. And then when we move on to the marketing step, uh, we market our inventions in a variety of ways, uh, direct contact with company via phone and email, online, we post our technologies on a variety of platforms. Um, and when there's not a pandemic going on, uh, we'll attend local and national events uh, in various research areas trying to, to market our technologies. Uh, and then once we identify a licensee and we go through the licensing process, we'll negotiate the agreement with them, uh, discuss the specific terms, whether it's an exclusive license or non-exclusive, what's the term, uh, what's the territory, is it US worldwide? What fields do you want to use the invention in and what the royalties back to the university and the inventors would be. Uh, and then we would execute the agreement and monitor for compliance, making sure the company is doing everything it said it would do. Um, and then we manage the royalties. Um, so you could see this little pie chart on the side of the screen. Um, that's just a very rudimentary breakdown of essentially what the royalty split is. Uh, it's essentially two thirds goes back to the university. It would go to your department, your college. Um, it would go back to the university generally to reinvest in future research. And then one third would go back to all of the creators, all of the inventors that worked on the invention for their personal use. <clears throat> and then these are just a few uh, success stories I like to share that have come out of university technology transfer over the years. Uh, Gatorade's a very famous one that came out of the University of Florida. They've made over a billion dollars on that. And an interesting fact about that one is that uh, the formula wasn't uh, patented or, or anything like that. Uh, university of Florida made all of their money just on the trademark of Gatorade alone. Um, Taxol is a cancer treatment drug that came out of Florida State University a while ago. They've made over $350 million on that. Um, and Google is actually from technology transfer. Uh, some of the creators of Google came from Stanford University and they've made over $336 million on that. So uh, these are all aspirational examples. Uh, obviously we can't guarantee that level of success with everything, but it's, it's definitely a goal to set for yourself. Uh, so with that, I'll say thank you. Uh, this is how to contact us and I will stop sharing my screen and turn it back over to Shilaja uh, if there are any questions. Oh, thank you, Dana. That's great. So we have a couple questions and I have a question too. So now let's first start with the students' questions. Okay, the first question is, uh, when it comes to patents on biologically active chemicals, can you still patent how you isolate the chemical? I once heard that you can have new processes of creating or isolating thin things like insulin patented. Uh, so yes, I did talk about this briefly. Um, so prior to 2013 and that Myriad Genetics uh, Supreme Court case I mentioned, you could patent things that you had isolated. Um, so insulin, uh, adrenaline, vitamin B12, things like that used to be patentable. Uh, but since that Supreme Court case came, um, now uh, just isolating those chemicals isn't enough to warrant a patent. There really has to be some more uh, man-made manipulation. Uh, you really have to, to change the chemical in some manner um, that makes it different from how it occurs naturally in order to be able to obtain a patent. Okay. All right, thank you. So that next question it is like, is the Heimlich maneuver trademarked? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I don't know the answer to that, um, but I would be interested to find out. So I can research that and, and get back to you. And you know where to reach uh, Dana. So you can email her again if she forgets. <laughs> uh, 
Okay, so great presentation. Another question is, yeah, so this is a question for, I think, um, CMBB and Dr. Beninger. Like, will this file be accessible online for download? So yeah, we're working on that stuff actually. So to keep these lectures somewhere, posted somewhere. Yeah, so when you're talking about licensing, you said about exclusivity, exclusivity and non-exclusivity. Could you expand on that, please? Sure. Um, so let's say you're patenting a new pharmaceutical drug that you created. Um, and it has applications in different fields. Um, it's hard for me to think of things off the top of my head, um, but let's say maybe you could use it for treating cancer, but it also has applications in neurodegenerative degenerative diseases or something like that. Something where you can use the intellectual property in several different ways. Uh, you would have the option to license it to a company exclusively meaning that only that company is allowed to use the intellectual property um, and you could give them a license uh, for all fields, meaning they can use it however they want. Um, or you could choose to license it non-exclusively, meaning that you could license it to several different companies and they could use it in several different ways without overlapping with what each other is doing. Uh, typically exclusive licenses are more valuable because it's preventing all of the company's competitors from using it, um, but non-exclusive licenses uh, are, are frequently executed as well. I see, that's great, yeah, okay. So any other, I think that's it. So any other questions, anyone? All right, thank you so much, Dana. Thank you, everyone. So with that, yeah, bye then. Thanks.